before starting, I actually want to ask like uh, what I should focus on because I um, didn't really know like what you would be interested in, uh, like the concepts or like the uh, technical stuff between uh, multiple viewpoints framework. So uh, the presentation right now is longer than my, it has more pages than my thesis. Uh, so I can just, you know, skip out anything you don't want to and I can do, like, focus on other stuff. And I would say, uh, uh, your contribution, like, in terms of completion of analysis of the question, and what's, what's the main idea? Yeah, go through the concepts, the concepts uh, what it is, the aims, what it is, why there's something interesting that you can do. Okay. And uh, like it also has all the mathematical explanations inside and if you like want to ask stuff I can also explain later. So anyway this is feel free to skip to the end of the uh, that that I will do. <laughs> Don't worry. So anyways uh, as you can see there are lots of stuff. Even the abbreviation of my thesis is long. Uh, Uh, anyways, like the um, motivation um, that I kind of st started is um, like in Georgia Tech we have done a couple of stuff about improvisation, uh, mostly on imp uh, improvising with tabla. So uh, it was kind of my starting point too. So imp improvisation is a very complex phenomenon, and um, we don't actually know what is going on. Or um, even like in the computational side, there's a huge semantic gap. Um, and like the previous work by uh, Pierce, like one year ago, uh, he has actually shown like there is a correlation between uh, variable length Markov models, engrams, multiple viewpoints, whatever, with the human and spatial. So now we kind of know, at least in Western music, it has some um, relationship with humans. So uh, I kind of wanted to start it um, with the uh, like non-occidental music so and the other thing is um, the like this is a kind of a predictive modeling so uh, as it if it goes to you know uh, further and further it might actually be kind of like a uh, interactive uh, application or like the core of something like that uh, like it can be an educational tool which will help like uh, beginner students or like people from other cultures uh, to understand like what are the key concepts uh, in like Turkish folk music. So, or um, like probably uh, people in Turkey might, uh, you know, run after me with their balamas, but it might also be used for like uh, machine performances with like interactive uh, improvisational stuff and um, the other thing which I'm uh, very uh, ambitious about is the multiculturalism part so um, like I kind of um, feel like um, in the MIR community <coughs> it is um, mostly like WMIR like Western Music Information Retrieval there are um, very few stuff going on uh, and um, like I mean I'm not saying like the English should uh, study another music but um, I kind of feel like uh, we should be you know doing some stuff to actually improve it and uh, kind of open up like new paths for like um, cultural creativity like in a multicultural context not uh, just st sticking into the Western classical traditions or like Western folk musics. And so um, I will make it this part pretty short. I will just explain what uh, the key differences between Ottoman classical and traditional Turkish. Um, so these stuff are like mostly explained by Barish, Kemal, and everybody. Um, I will just say like um, this is uh, the initial and uh, final notes thingy like. Uh, I kind of learned it from Okamurat Öztürk. Uh, so in uh, Turkish, like in makam music, um, when we are talking about like tonics and dominance, 
it is kind of flaky because it's not a phonal tradition. It's actually a modal tradition. It's kind of like the um, like the closest thing would probably be like the medieval music where they had like finalis and initial notes. Uh, and then ours is also kind of like that. So başlangıç and karar, which their literal translations are initial and final. Um, we should actually look to the music like that instead of saying like there's a, tam there's a tonic or there's a dominant. And um, so as uh, everybody explained today, it, the suggested number of pitches range from 17 to seven, uh, 79. And um, the mainstream theory, like the theory uh, which is taught in today's school is Aralezgi Uzdilek, but it's and uh, right now there's kind of like a paradigm shift, like uh, it's criticized with uh, contemporary scholars a lot, especially with the ones who are coming uh, from the folk music tradition, because uh, Arya Lezgi Uzdilek theory, uh, they couldn't find a, a nice explanation to Turkish folk by that time, I guess. So uh, tradition, typically they leave Turkish folk music outside their scope and as I explained, they use tonal terminology, and if you actually um, look like the f uh, like how Aral explained like Chargah Makam, Makam, and all those, he was actually kind of trying to westernize the music in a sense. Maybe that wasn't what he wanted. Maybe that was that's another story. But it's uh, like it kind of makes uh, a disjunction between the actual practice. So. Um, in Turkish folk music, uh, typic the typical instrument is bağlama, which has um, which usually has 17 notes in an octave. So in uh, and you usually bağla because bağlama is a dominant instrument. If there are any other instruments, uh, they are usually tuned according uh, to uh, bağlama. Even if there is a canon, uh, they as far as I know, they try to uh, play it together with the bağlama. And um, because of that thing, and there's also this other thing, like in every region, um, the tunings might change. Or uh, a player, he will just say like, okay, I want uh, this pitch a little bit uh, higher. So he will just play with the frets of Balam and he will make up his own. So it actually kind of makes uh, more sense if we treat the quarter tones as uh, non-deterministic, uh, with a non-deterministic deviation rather than uh, uh, saying like this is like the distinct deviation it should be like, s I don't know, like 50 cents or whatever. So uh, Usul, I think I can just take it out, except um, I will use this term Usul Sus, non-metered, uh, because of the musical form I'm using. Um, so anyways, um, Turkish folk music, as I said, is explainable by Makam theory. And uh, the other ones are not important. Yeah. So the form I studied in my master's thesis is Uzunava. And uh, in folk music, you can, uh, in terms of usul, uh, separate the music in like two forms. Not exactly, but you can roughly say it like. The pieces with the uh, definite usul, uh, you can say like they are krikavas, and uh, if they integrate some kind of usulsuz sections, they are usually called uzunavas. And um, you can also kind of treat uh, usulsuz sections as structured improvisations because they um, they you know do this sayer around the initial or the final tones or like other modal centers. And um, the music is typically set. So um, today I will actually uh, play the like. Oh, is it not heard? Oh, damn! It won't be heard because my audio jack is burned. But anyways. I'll just play like 20 seconds or something, so it's not important. So you see our musicologist in here, but it's actually Musa Erolu, the other virtuoso who is playing uh, most of the stuff. But as you can hear, it is uh, non-metered. So 
the way he plays is more free, but you can also hear like it always uh, goes to like converges to these centers, and then the vocal starts. So he's even like he doesn't have a meter, and so he will just go on like this. I just want to show like the last part. So as you can see, they kind of came into a usul um, because this is like a common practice in uh, Turkish folk music. You you kind of uh, you might want to connect a uzun hava to a kırık hava later, like a kind of you know. In this one, it was like prominent, but in some some of the examples, it might not be that prominent, but whatever. Okay, so related works, I will just take it out. And Barış Bozkurt explained this part very well, so I will just uh, put this one uh, because this is, uh, to my best knowledge, the only thing that was done on uh, analysis of melodies. So Gündüz and Gündüz, uh, they are from Middle East Technical University, and they have um, done this like mathematical analysis of like four Ottoman classical pieces and two Turkish folk music. But uh, the way they treat uh, the music is like complex structures. So they don't um, really say about like their uh, mathematical stuff, they are very formidable, uh, very nice, but they have no indication of like if it actually correlates with the human anticipation or even like in the notation, they don't say anything like, um, they just say like entropy increases and decreases, but they don't say like if it's uh, visually uh, understandable in the notation. Or, and they also have, um, they are very strict into Aral Uzilek theory, so what they uh, claim is uh, Turkish folk music is uh, like, it cannot be explained by makams, which is like a definite wrong thing in the start. So uh, with, in terms of ethnomusicology or like human ant anticipation, um, this like work is not very mm, nice. But anyway, so, uh, this is the contribution part, and like the first one, um, this is like probably the one which took the most time and it gave the less least benefits. But uh, I kind of, uh, as far as I know, there are only two uh, machine readable databases, and one is the parametric music database, which uh, Barış Bozkurt has uh, put <coughs> the F zero, and Mustokur. Like I don't know any other uh, databases with Turkish music, like with melodies. And um, if there are any, okay. And uh, like when I was studying, I felt like uh, it's one of the key factors uh, of maybe why anybody, like not in uh, only in Turkey, but in any part of the world, they weren't doing anything with Turkish music because they simply cannot find anything. So uh, I kind of wanted to put something, and because Uzuna was like um, in the Western sense, they are very unconventional, like non-metered improvisations. They are not really found a lot uh, until 20th century in uh, like conventional Western music. So I thought it would be something nice. And so, to my best knowledge, it's the first symbolic notation of Uzuna was, uh, which is readable by machines. And, uh, well, obviously that is not a novelty or anything, um, but the novelty of what I did in my thesis is kind of, uh, I try to define um, n like novel pitch-related viewpoints that will take the 17 uh, tone scale of Turkish music into consideration. So I kind of try to um, make a parallel uh, thesis with uh, Daryl Conklin's master's thesis in 1990-ish. And um, apart from that, like this is the first attempt of predictive modeling of m melodies. And this is the uh, first usage of variable length Marco models. And um, so the database 
it is like a moderate one. It's, it doesn't have a lot of songs because TRT database has like 120 songs and half of them, which I didn't include, they are, they are like unsalvageable. Um, so I have kind of tried to salvage with uh, Erdal Tucular. He's uh, in Department of Music Education in Gazi University. And Okamura Tösürk has also helped me a lot uh, with this. So I kind of discussed them like what to include, how to include them. And they try to help me as much as they can, but that is like uh, as much as we did. So 77 songs, a little more than 10,000 notes, eight makams, but most of the stuff are in Husseini, which makes sense because Husseini is played a lot. And Hijaz and Ushak are kind of like the um, like ones which you can do, like individual analysis, like you cannot do anything with Kajiar because there is only one piece. Uh, so um, before like going to what I done, maybe this part might be kind of important. Like Barış Bozkurt has explained some of it again, but um, like using symbolic notations have like interesting problems. Like uh, should we really use kind of a Western nice transcription method to uh, represent all those modulations or other, you know, um, stuff which are prominent in Turkish music, like, is it really nice? And uh, Yalçın Tura in his book actually explains um, with practical inf uh, explanations of uh, how Western stuff notation, mostly in the start of the Republican era, may, um, went to the, like, took the music into a little bit more, uh, like, wrong directions. And, um, he also criticized TRT a lot. And um, this thing, like the database of TRT, I didn't know uh, when I started it. Uh, like I didn't know it was this bad. But um, simply everybody I talked with uh, after I came to Turkey in summer, they were, and including you, uh, they were all saying like you shouldn't have started with TRT database, like for Uzunavas. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think I showed you some of, and you said like, "Oh, they are very bad." But I may have said they are very bad, but I, I think I didn't say you should start with it. So I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, maybe it, it was my mistake. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, like the reason why I still have chosen, uh, like decided to stick with the symbolic database in summer is. Um, even though symbolic data might be uh, kind of not the best idea, uh, doing audio analysis is very, it might, it's not as straightforward. So um, you cannot really do um, like fast stuff um, with audio. Like you have to do like automatic transcriptions, onset detections, blah, blah. So as it is like the first step of uh, predictive modeling in Turkish folk, I thought it will be much better to keep everything simple and um, try to focus on like the uh, what should be improved afterwards. And I think that was a nice. Do you have audio recordings for these notations? Some of them, like um, for example, I have the Göçeleri, uh, Avşerbeyleri, and all those, but some I couldn't find them. So. Mm-hmm, yeah, uh, but uh, like to be sincere, after I finished my thesis, you know, I kind of packed it for uh, like two months or something. Now I want to work on it, but that time I didn't, <laughs> I was, I didn't want to see it because it became <laughs> like my summer friend. Anyways, um, so this is, um, I will also pass it very quick, but I kind of want to give this criticism of uh, the practical issues in uh, optical music recognition right now. So obviously uh, the industrial programs, they only, uh, they just want to sell stuff. So uh, they cannot really sell it to the oriental world right now. So they have the, uh, like the law 
in the low level, um, they can mostly understand the characters and everything. But when it comes to the higher level, like understanding a makam, they have no idea. So um, the problem with uh, optical music recognition is I don't feel like the technology is not there yet, but uh, the way it is set up, it's uh, very biased to Western music. So if um, like some you know some improvements can be easily made, uh, like a, as a practical uh, explanation, like Hijaz Makam, uh, it has a flat and a and then a sharp, and Hijaz is like one of the kind of easy Makams, like simple Makams, but this recognition software, because uh, there are no you know, flat and sharp together in Western classical, it has no idea of what is going on. And it tries to put the uh, sharp to the first note it sees. And because it's Uzunava Osiris, it tries to put it to all the files. And then there goes the manual uh, encodings. So anyways, and this is like the conceptual uh, stuff of how the technical part is. So the computational modeling is based on uh, engram models and um, on top of it, like variable length Markov models. And we are using um, Asex and Dubno's like prediction suffix tree uh, stuff. Um, we are using smoothing. And um, I will also de explain zero fre frequency problem in a couple of words afterwards. And uh, I'm yeah, I'm uh, representing the music in, in parallel representations and as the so-called multiple viewpoints modeling. And I also have like, a, we have built a long-term and a short-term model to uh, make uh, the predictions uh, conveying to a particular style, but in a, uh, but it will sound like a particular song. So engram models. The only thing I would probably say is like lower uh, engrams will uh, capture the generality. Like we can kind of see like uh, Neva D is uh, it's, it might be a model center in this case because it is seen a lot. Obviously, this is a toy example, but uh, it's kind of nice in there. But uh, as the engrams go bigger, um, you will get like more specific information like what happens after we reach to the model center, blah, blah. And I'm also kind of skipping Marco model stuff. The only thing maybe we can say is like um, uh, a Marco model, like a first order Marco model will uh, be built on top of like uh, engrams with size two. And as you can see, it is simply like you will have a state and you will have like transition probabilities and it will say like, okay, now I'm in D, what is the probability of me going to E? So what you need to do is just count the uh, E's after D's and set it up like it's also, you can also do it in a matrix stuff. And for the Marco model is the generalization. And um, yeah, I think it's also kind of known, but uh, as Marco models get bigger, it becomes computationally very expensive unless you do some kind of clever way of storing and accessing the uh, data. And uh, the data will get very sparse even if you have like millions of points or anything. And um, so variable length Marco models kind of deals with the sparsity issue. So it will check uh, the lower orders to uh, capture the generality to obtain some kind of regularity. And uh, in the higher uh, orders, it will try to uh, pinpoint like some specific phrases, which uh, will be like, if it finds it, it will say like, oh, it's there, so I should definitely use it kind of thing. And anyway, so uh, to deal with the uh, performance issue, you can uh, use uh, the so-called prediction suffix trees. And uh, like the, in the simplest case sense, uh, they do not store the unseen engram, so you don't need to go through like all the zero stuff, so it is kind of faster. So um, this is kind of like, you can think of it as a visualization of PSD trees. So this will be like the uh, zeroth level first and uh, second, so 
this will be the like engram of size one or mark Markov model of uh, zero to order Markov model. So um, this is very easy to uh, you know visualize and like this number gives the count of uh, like the way I visualizes it gives the count and it gives the probability of that. So um, in smoothing, um, unless we do, uh, do some kind of compensation, because uh, we will definitely not see like loss of counts in the higher order models. So uh, without compensating, uh, we will bond us to the lower order <coughs> models, uh, like because they, there will be like hundreds of one node. And anyway, so for that we need to do kind of a smoothing and uh, try to emphasize the higher order models. And uh, there are like two ways. One is back off models. The other one is the interpolation model. So back off, if it uh, finds one in the higher order, it will say, OK, I got it. So I don't care about any other. Uh, but if it cannot find, it will recursively try to go in the lower orders. In interpolation, it um, kind of tries to uh, learn, like consult all of them with some kind of weight. And um, so, like, long story short, uh, back off uh, kind of work better if, uh, like, our higher order models uh, are very definite, like, if it can find something. But if it cannot find, then um, entropy based evaluations, which I will explain later, they don't, uh, they are not, they don't become happy. And uh, into interpolation models, uh, if we don't want like a bad miss, and I mean it's kind of it might be more important in like melodic music, like um, while you are playing in something, you don't want to end up in a totally random note. So um, this might be kind of better. And in our previous research, um, it was also like in terms of entropy, and uh, that was kind of the case for us. But it's also like uh, debatable, like uh, back off models, they gave like better median and interpolated give better average perplexity. So it's whichever side you want to do. And um, but from the interpolated, we found that one divided by n method was uh, at least for tabla, it was giving um, the best results. So it's very simple, like number of uh, max, like it's the maximum order and it is the uh, order. So I have a very simple example. It can be checked later. And for the zero frequency problem, if um, our data is sparse, then um, we simply won't find anything. Um, even if, like, it, it might think like uh, that will be a very prominent melody, uh, but the system will think like, oh, I have never learned it before, so it shouldn't be there. So I'm just giving it a zero probability, and you wouldn't want something like that. So uh, you kind of try to uh, understand how confident your system is by checking um, the uh, engrams, uh, which have like one uh, or count of one, and you divide it by the number of elements being seen. So uh, and in the special case, if there uh, if there are none, you just give like one divided by the whole length. And it, it is very helpful, especially with uh, entropy calculations. Um, that will be also explained later. <coughs> but for example, uh, in this, you can kind of see like this is 1 divided by 13. In this one, in, even in the uh, second like engram, you can see like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 divided by 10. So it gets like less confident and confident. And in this one, you will be very lucky to find a hit. So uh, escape probabilities will kind of uh, tell, like the system will tell you, hey, I'm expecting something new. Because every time you uh, train me with something, I, I see new stuff. So I should see something new. So that in that sense, it actually uh, it's more intelligent. And anyway, so um, the power of the system comes from this uh, general modeling scheme called multiple viewpoints. So um, it's simply uh, its power or the weakness comes from um, 
how you are trying to represent your data. And uh, in the music case, it is kind of evident like uh, you have like different choices. Like you can um, represent it with durations, with pitches, or uh, like some advanced stuff like scale degrees. Uh, you can decide maybe it will have like in Uznawas, for example, if the transcriptions uh, indicate uh, are transcribed with fermatas, maybe you might want to use them to understand phrase boundaries. So uh, you can use stuff like that. And um, like sometimes uh, one would uh, be better than the other uh, for a particular song. Like maybe for one page, uh, like for page rev, one uh, viewpoint will be better. For SASMIC, the other one will be better. And uh, did I? No, it's not in here. So um, there are three types. Basic one, which you can directly fetch like duration or pitch. Drive types come from the ones that are basic, like scale degree. And cross types, uh, you simply get like two viewpoints. And um, you make a tuple so that um, they kind of become like, I, you know, uh, separate. Like uh, if I should give an example, a quarter C, a quarter D, and an eight C will. They will all have like different uh, tuples dedicated to themselves and they will be treated differently. And uh, so if we have a large database, like let's uh, think of like, if we, it's kind of a bad example, but if we are trying to model the car GR Macam, which only has one, uh, using the Uzunawa Hamdram database, then the, uh, and if we try to uh, train it over the whole data, and if we are to use leave one out model, then car GR will die. Like there is no way we can model it. So um, what we maybe should do is to have a long-term model to understand the musical style and then have a short-term model uh, which will try to pick out the peculiarities in that uh, particular song. So um, long-term model will be trained over the database. Short-term will uh, only trade on the... Uh, song and it will be like real time. You don't do it like non-causal way. It's as you feed the data. And for merging ter term models, there are a couple of ways, but we are simply using a entropy based one again. Um, you can check the ex it later. So for uh, the experiment, I have uh, taken out all the other stuff and I have also taken out Ushak Makam because uh, you might kind of Convince it with Hijaz or no? Which one? Husseini. Uh, yeah, it's close to Husseini. Yeah, what? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for that I <laughs> I have taken it out, and uh, I have also taken out the um, transpose one, like J Husseini, all those. I have taken them out, so I would get like better results, but. Whatever, so um, as I said, I kind of try to make it in parallel with uh, Conklin's master's thesis. So uh, he has defined a bunch of uh, stuff for uh, Bach's chorals, chorals. And uh, like I have taken the eight viewpoints from his and the remaining seven are like my contributions. So it's kind of the list. So duration is uh, his, sand deviation comes from mine. Contour is uh, his, um, so this is his notes with sand deviations is mine. But uh, by the way, I'm treating these not like a uh, derived or a cross type because you know, Turkish music does is not derived from Western. So I'm not really saying like uh, that should be like kind of wrong. So uh, I, I'm just using it because uh, in Hamdram uh, you need to specify uh, it with sand. So that was like how I thought everybody would understand. And anyway, so um, this is kind of limited. Uh, I didn't have um, much time to implement some of the stuff, but like in this table later you can check like how internally they are encoded. And implementation, I will also take it fast, but the thing maybe I should mention it is like, um, it is implemented in uh, GTMC, GTCMT, 
uh, and it's in C++ and it's compiled as a max MSP external. So uh, right now it's not very well main maintained, but maybe I'll try uh, to do some stuff with it later if uh, we are to decide like how to do it. Anyways, so uh, evaluation is the uh, one out cross validation. Uh, so I'm using uh, average cross entropy to uh, understand how good my system is. I'm I'm also uh, giving like showing classification accuracy, but as you will see in a predictive uh, one, you don't want like uh, classification because you might actually find like a nice peak, like you will probably stay in the same makam and you will be very close, but in classification it will say like yes or no. So it's not a kind of good way to uh, assess like a predictive system, but it will be um, better to understand um, how confident our system is uh, when he picks up a node. So cross entropy kind of works with it. And uh, because we have escape probabilities, like if you put zero in <coughs> here, it will go to 1000, but escape probabilities kind of deal with it. So that is why escape probability is also nicer. And I'm um, reporting them in perplexity. It is, you can simply um, say it like, um, you can interpret it like how many, like from how many nodes uh, the system picks a uh, prediction. Like if the perplexity is four, it uh, picked it, like it wasn't sure about between like four, you can kind of interpret it like that. So um, this is like the accu uh, classification accuracies, which as you can see, except for duration, which goes nice, they suck. And uh, they some are even worse than the priors. But as I said, like it's not a good one. Uh, I have just put it because uh, there's also Izmir paper for it, and they wanted the classification stuff. So, like we knew they would suck. They should. Anyways, um, this is like the, we kind of try to find the optimum um, order, like to understand like how long should we check for the uh, melodic progression. And after four, it's okay, probably nine. But uh, when I checked it statistically, I think it was four. I don't remember it right now, but it's written in the thesis. And uh, this is like a table of uh, the average and median perplexities. So um, as you can see, they are kind of, uh, like successful, like if you check the priors, for example, it says like 75. So it, if it tries to match the duration and the uh, melodic interval with sand deviation, it will be confused uh, by 75. So it simply cannot find. But then uh, when you look at the short term model, it becomes like 7.5. So it means like it's got like 10 times more confident in what it's doing. And the other thing you can check is, see is like short term model kind of uh, wins over long term model or the combination of uh, long term model and short term model. It kind of implies that uh, it might imply two stuff like the transcriptions, um, they probably have like each song has this kind of you know strong patterns inside, which in a transcription you would uh, kind of think like that because everybody's style will be kind of different to like transcribe so. Um, but it might also mean like provided um, they are all done very neatly and the songs might also have like very distinct improvisation, uh, imp like improvisation patterns. So the sayers might also be different from songs to songs. Um, so, um, when I checked like the average perplexities per song, uh, it was like seen uh, some had like very high perplexities and it's mostly because of the uh, uncommon durations like dotted notes and some transcribers, they really like to put like two dotted notes to show like how good their ears are. And uh, like some of the lengths of the songs are very short, like maybe 
4D nodes or something. So when there's a ripple in a per average uh, perplexity, when you average it, you will still see the effect of the ripple. So they weren't really nice. But the other thing is like, you know, I was claiming like in one case, A viewpoint might be better. In an other case, the viewpoint B will be better. And it was actually seen in this these two. So sometimes, uh, melodic interval was significantly better than the scale degree and sometimes it was the other and like in the end of the thesis I kind of had like a couple of uh, like one day or something and I really wanted to check if uh, I was finding something meaningful or like some random note so I kind of mined uh, like the uh, predictions the uh, max MSB uh, like what it gave to me. So this is like the actual ending of one uh, one piece. I think it was in uh, yeah, it's in Husseini. So um, like this one ga gave like um, this is the long term model, and you can actually see like the entropy profile in here. I think in this case, combined model for this short excerpt, it was um, it gave the best, but you'll probably see like it has a very distinct pattern. Like it goes uh, down very understandable, but no, none of them can uh, get it. Except they all go to the final note and they are very confident with it. So uh, as you can see, there are some uh, predictions which hold and maybe some which might not hold. Uh, for this, we definitely need to go to audio and maybe do like some human uh, like anticipation checks. And so, like long story short, the perplexities show the system is uh, with our baseline is very confident, so it kind of works. And um, short term model shows like the data set has like very prominent patterns uh, in every song that are not seen in the other ones. And this is also kind of parallel with what we found in tabla sequences. It was also the same with that. And uh, I don't really remember how much, uh, how many pieces we tried in that, but for example, a kaida form uh, would give something different from another form. Kaida is an improvisational tabla uh, composition. So it was kind of parallel with it. And actually, Tabla Music and Uzunava, they have like some analogies to uh, lose one, but they have. And anyways, um, like uh, this thesis, like I would maybe claim uh, the new viewpoints, they kind of captured uh, the 17 tone scale in a uh, relatively successful manner. So. Uh, it kind of shows like we can also apply the multiple viewpoints. We might apply the multiple viewpoints to Turkish music with uh, some success, like uh, it was implemented in Western music. And um, oh, I, I have forgotten it, but uh, in the like when you co uh, when you compare the sand uh, deviations and the normal twelve tone ones, there is actually a very insignificant increase. Uh, in the perplexity values. The reason for that is, uh, you know, if it's like a Husseini makam, um, or like, okay, Hijaz makam, uh, no, Husseini is much better in that. Bec like, let's say like, if it has like F sharp three uh, in the transcription, it won't have a lot of F sharps. So it always uh, goes to the F sharps when you kind of separate those two from 12 tone to 17 tone. So, um, it kind of means like the transcriptions really obey, like we know it because I have encoded the whole database. I know transcriptions strictly obey. And when I checked the perplexities, I also know that the predictive model is also very strict about choosing the um, quarter tone accidentals whenever he predicts it. And so, but this obviously gives a negative criticism because we know like a ascending sayer and a descending sayer should <coughs> have like different temporary accidentals. So we can, mm, this is very prominent, like in Uzunava database, they are not there. 
and um, this is a big criticism actually of um, the thesis. So I I cannot really claim that I have a very nice um, model of the Sayers. And this is not that nice. Uh, and yeah, again, going back to the uh, do the transcriptions really uh, represent the uh, Uzunova form? This is still a big question mark. So for that, we have to go to the future work. But before, so these are the stuff maybe I might try in the future, like contour might be nice to indicate the ascending and descending scales. Uh, it might be nice to understand like where they fit, like how they behave. And obviously crossing them with pitch later stuff. And like the initial tone and the, um, so like up till now the viewpoints and the pitch related ones, they are all uh, related to the karar tone. But we also have the Bach-language tone. So maybe it might be nice if we also create uh, pitch related viewpoints to them. So it might also give us some like temporal information like, you know, it will start from the Bach language tone, then it will kind of go to the color. So we can actually uh, distinguish it when we have like two viewpoints for that and we can have like a kind of uh, understanding of how different sections, uh, the melodies in different sections are. And like, Especially in Uzunavas, using fermata might be really nice because um, it will show you where the phrase boundaries are. And again, time signature, it will, uh, it can show you like when uh, in usulsu sections and in the usulsu sections of the same piece, uh, we can actually check like are there any you know inclinations to like particular pitch, like are they similar or do they have like some kind of differences? We can also uh, try to understand it from that. But so, as I said, uh, the most important thing is to actually understand like are these symbolic stuff, they kind of go uh, parallel with the real stuff. So the first step should probably be the audio, uh, integrating audio. So in our um, Tableau paper in JNMR, we have actually not me, but Avinash have coded the uh, variable length hidden Markov model uh, framework too. So it's also there. But uh, audio analysis, that's a huge issue. Like uh, as Parish Boskut have been saying, like transcription algorithms and all those, they will be, you know, a very big resource. So it won't be probably very fast, but it might be like a, a direction that we would like to go as a I mean, I might want to go as a PhD thesis, but whatever. So, and uh, like we can also make a generative system if it kind of becomes like, uh, if it reaches some kind of level. Uh, I'm kind of not talking about the interactive stuff, but we might use it to, you know, uh, generate melodies uh, and ask like the uh, maybe experts about like how they feel about the generated patterns. Say like, do you find this nice? And then we can also ask him like, how would you play it? Or how would you notate it? And then we can maybe uh, using the, uh, like we can cross compare them uh, in the way Andre explained today, maybe. I don't know, like I, uh, I haven't thought of like how it w they will be cross compared and um, I think music, like the cognitive stuff, might uh, have a prominent role. Like we can try to figure out, uh, as in the symbolic data, they were like Conklin's and Pierce's stuff kind of relate to my thesis, so they have a correlation. But will they also hold for the music perception and cognition? That's uh, maybe if we kind of do that, then we can really say like multiple viewpoints this general framework might be, um, very, it's a very flexible and it's very powerful. So we can make like a, you know, contribution like that in the future maybe. And yeah, interactive stuff, I will.
yeah, the educational software might be more relevant to the comp music, but the other ones, they are not. And so this is kind of like the fastest presentation I have given. And it's like the... So, uh, this is one of the stuff I, it's in the future work. Uh, where is this? Yes, the time signature thingy. So, this is what I want to implement. Um, time signature will basically be like, you know, uh, it will give the usul of each note, but then when the signature changes, like it be goes to the usulsus part, then it will put it. So. Um, I really wanted to try it out, but um, for that I didn't have much time. Like some uzunalas, they can also have usulü, like the meter sections. So uh, I kind of try to avoid them in the analysis. Um, but I mean, somewhere in there, I. I really couldn't say like I wasn't able to. I took them out because then the database data set will be too small. But yeah, this is more of a future work thingy. Yeah. 